morning, church. Um, <laughs> we're going to read uh, from Mark 6, uh, 1 to 6. He left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What is this wisdom that has been given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives and his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder and pastor here. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. We have been in a series looking at the life of Jesus through the lens of Mark. This morning, we look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Just six verses, but there's so much in these six verses to learn from. Faith and unbelief. If you have faith that the latest and greatest diet method works, like the keto diet, starting that new method will yield that smaller waistline, a healthier lifestyle. But if you have doubt, then the consequences of that unbelief or doubt may be seen in ignoring the plan, indulging on those food firm favorites, and somehow the consequences of the washing machine shrinking your clothes. <laughs> this is a movie called The Life of Pi, um, a movie about a young man named Pi who, serve, who, who survives a shipwreck and is then stranded on a lifeboat in the Pacific Ocean with a Bengal tiger. Throughout this movie or shipwreck, Pi's faith in God and his ability to find beauty and meaning in the world sustains him even as he faces unimaginable challenges. When we are faced with challenges or moments of unbelief, do we lean more on God or fall back to doubt and live in the consequences of that doubt? This morning we will see that faith in God does enable us to encounter God. This morning we will see that doubt may hide the identity of God, the promises of God and his blessings in our life. We should be encouraged this morning that our faith needs to be in Jesus and his victory on the cross for us. This victory should build an intimacy and, and faith in him that helps us to continue growing in knowledge of him and helps us shape our world views and enable us to see more of God. We will see that unbelief is destructive. Let's pray as we get into God's word. Lord, we thank you that uh, this morning we can gather as your people to praise and worship you, to fellowship and to sit under the lordship of your word. I pray that at this point in time as we listen to your voice, as we listen to your word through the Bible, that you'd speak through my vocal cords and that your people would hear your voice. I pray that by your spirit that you'd be here that you'd remove all the distractions that tend to form around us, but help us to focus on you. May your word touch our hearts and remain in our hearts and produce the change that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Three points this morning and then we will be out of here. Exposition of the text, reflections of the text, and application of the text. We see Mark, the author, this is a bit of background to the book. We see Mark, the author of the book, produce a spoiler alert. A spoiler alert is that moment that someone, that moment when someone tells you what's going to come next or what's going to come before you've realized it. So Mark produces a spoiler alert. 
in a movie context, you might see a spoiler alert form in like someone telling you that the main character is not going to get that girl, or that the movie doesn't have an ending, or the book ends with, a, with no logical explanation and you have to come up with one yourself. So, th so that might be a, an example of a spoiler alert. However, Mark goes one up. He writes the first eight chapters with a theme around the words, who is Jesus? So first eight chapters, who is Jesus? And in the first 12 words of the first chapter, he spills the beans on who Jesus is. Yeah. In verse 1, he says, the beginning of the gospel of, uh, of Jesus, the, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he spilled the beans. Mark only does this once, only tells us once, the readers of the letter, who he thinks Jesus is. Then he presents evidence to present to the reader who Jesus is, for the reader to discover who Jesus is. Mark also shows the different reactions to who Jesus is as he writes. From chapter 1 till 6, we see Jesus baptized. We see Jesus starting his ministry, which is to proclaim the good news of God. And we see that good news in chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We see Jesus calling the disciples as he goes about teaching and preaching. Chapters 2 to 5, we see Jesus forgive sins. We see Jesus preach, teach, heal, and perform miracles. Jesus moves from town to town, walking with the disciples while proclaiming the good news, calling people to repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of God has come near. If you missed any of these sermons, if you missed our sermon series so far, feel free to catch it on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. Let's look at our first point, exposition. We are a gospel-centered church and we believe in exposition of the text, which is comprehensively breaking down the text to understand all its ideas and themes, to understand the text as the writer would have wanted us to understand. So let's look at our first point, exposition. So we start in verse 1 of chapter 6. It reads as follows. He left there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? They said. What is this wisdom that has been given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? So Jesus enters his hometown, his hood, the place where he grew up. His hometown is Nazareth. He, although Bethlehem is a place where Jesus is born, that's his place of birth, but his family settled and grew up, and he grew up in Nazareth, which is why Nazareth is his hometown, because the family settled there, and that is where he grew up. In the Bible times, people were identified by their birthplace or the place where they spent the most time. This identification is also fulfillment of Scripture. So in Matthew, in Matthew 2, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. If we fast forward to verse 23, then he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. So just a quick side road. Um, the words he would be called a Nazarene aren't words that are found in the Old Testament, but rather scholars believe that the fulfillment of this prophecy is fulfilled in the prediction of Jesus being from an unpopular or lowly viewed place a place that would and could be despised or viewed lesser. The town of Nazareth was seen as a small and frowned upon town. Nathaniel, who is called Bartholomew in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, says, Nazareth, can anything good come from here? When he hears that Jesus is from Nazareth, can anything good come from here? This will be significant as we see the story unfold. Jesus' hometown is Nazareth. It signifies to people in Bible times that he would amount to little as someone from a small and insignificant town. How could he amount to anything? Can anything good come from there, in the words of Nathaniel, who is one of Jesus' disciples from Galilee? Jesus, too, is from Galilee, but from a town low in geographic area, sort of like a province. But before we see the mention of Jesus' hometown, we see that he was coming or left from there. That's, that's in the first verse. So where is there? There in this 
context is Capernaum, where Jesus was preaching and teaching in chapter 5. Also a place where Jesus spent a lot of time and performed a lot of miracles. So Jesus leaves Capernaum and to continue teaching. He, he goes back home with his disciples. The disciples were called by Jesus to follow him. They had moved with him from town to town and witnessed Jesus forgive sins, preach, heal, and perform miracles. It at first seems that, that his entrance to town has been one of no event. One might even say he was welcomed, but, but as we follow the story, we will see a different reaction. Jesus then waits for the Sabbath to teach, to teach because it says when the Sabbath came, he began to teach. Um, Jesus is likely making sure he doesn't cause conflict when he enters the town and immediately starts preaching, so waits for the, for the Sabbath to come and then goes to the synagogue to preach. Then we see the first reaction to Jesus. He teaches in the synagogue, and many of those who were there that heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? They were astonished. They were amazed at the teaching of Jesus as one who taught with authority, as one who possessed wisdom. They would have also heard about Jesus who was moving from town to town, teaching, performing miracles. So they were amazed as they see Jesus teaching. They were astonished at his teaching and the authority and wisdom that Jesus had. From verse 3, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. The reaction to Jesus changes to one of offense. So why are they offended? That's a great question. So one could, cons one could wonder if they initially thought Jesus possessed such intelligence, but then continuing to listen and maybe remembering he grew up around them, they might have thought that he was crazy. If you follow Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we see Jesus' family restrain him, saying, has he lost his mind? If you continue in verse 22 of chapter 3, we see the scribes. Scribes are people who study the scriptures and became uh, teachers, editors, and jurors, so people of the law. So these scribes from verse 22 say Jesus is possessed by demons as a source of his wisdom and miracles. Again, if you remember that Nazareth is seen as a small and significant town, what good can come from Nazareth? The people in the synagogue believe that they already know Jesus. They believe all that they need to know about him, they already know. They know he doesn't have a high level of education. He isn't a scribe. He isn't a Pharisee. He is a, he is a carpenter. They know his mother. They know his brothers and sisters. The message translation reads as follows. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He stole the show, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden? Get such ability. But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him. They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling and they never got any further. This reaction is one that shouldn't surprise us. They reject Jesus because they don't understand. There's disdain from the people because they feel he is unworthy. They look at him with scorn or contempt. In reality, many people reject what they don't understand if it comes into contact with the way they see and believe the world to be. Hidden Figures is a biographical drama which tells a story about African-American female mathematicians who make an impact at NASA during the space race. 
the rejection they face in a male-dominated and racially segregated institution comes from entrenched biases and a lack of appreciation and understanding of the women's capabilities. Another example is the rejection of Jesus or Christianity in Africa. Some reject from the lack of understanding or scorn because they believe Jesus is from the West and his gospel is from the West. They believe his good news is part of the West's attempt to colonize, but not understand that Jesus isn't from the West, but was born in the Middle East and is native born in Israel. The gospel, as he sends it out, comes to Africa first through the Egypt, Egypt, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, travels down to Africa to share the good news. So lack of understanding brings scorn and contempt. Like the introduction of Burger King, it brought scorn and disdain upon Steers. <laughs> but no, 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 Steers still has the 100% pure beef patty. <laughs> they still have the holy grail of burger building with the best ratio of meat to bun to garnish ratio. So, so they are still the epitome of burgers and hold a knowledge brief to continue producing the magic. So, okay, Jesus responds with the words that are now popular. A prophet is now not without honor except in his hometown among his relatives and in his whole household. The people of his household, his relatives and his household, have become so familiar to Jesus that it breeds contempt, it breeds disdain, it breeds scorn. The fact that they believe they know Jesus, some may even have seen him grow up as a little boy, brings about the scorn. Keith Green writes a song named Song to My Parents, I Only Want to See You There. Here's the lyrics of that song. Isn't that Jesus? Isn't it Joseph and Mary's son? Well, didn't he grow up right here? He played with our children. What? He must be kidding. Thinks he's a prophet? But prophets don't grow up from little boys, do they? from little boys, do they? So familiarity hardens the heart, or familiarity can harden the heart to understanding wisdom and authority that Jesus teaches with, authority that he performs miracles with, authority that he's given by God the Father. So familiarity can harden the heart to the real Jesus, to understanding who the real Jesus is. Verse 5. It reads as follows, he was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. Many times we see prophets, we, we see people's reaction to Jesus. Sometimes people are amazed. However, there are two instances, only two instances where the Bible records Jesus being amazed. Jesus is recorded in Matthew and Luke where he is amazed at the faith of a centurion. The centurion was a Roman soldier who had such faith in Jesus and his power to heal that he says through friends that he sends to Jesus to heal his servant. He says through, through these friends, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. So Jesus is amazed by this faith. Here Jesus is amazed at the unbelief of the people in his hood, in his hometown, in his gassy. He's, he's amazed at the unbelief. He's amazed at their lack of faith. Famous quoted words from Jesus to the disciples are found in Mark 11, verse 22, 23. Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. So faith moves mountains. Yep. Unbelief is as powerful as faith as it brings destruction. In Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we see the unbelief of Eve in the word of God, resulting in sin entering the world, brokenness and de de decay becoming a perpetuating cycle. Eve shows lack of faith when questioned and deceived by the serpent to not trust the word and intentions of God. She then disobeys God 
and lives in our unbelief, which causes brokenness and brings sin into the world. Revelations 21 verse 8, the last book in the Bible, speaks about unbelief bringing eternal damnation and separation from God. Unbelief causes those who don't believe to share in the lake that burns with sulfur, which is the eternal and final death. In between Genesis and Revelations, there are many more examples of of unbelief which bring destruction. Moses and the Israelites get near the promised land, but because of their continued unbelief along the way, they don't get to enjoy the promised land. In the times of Noah, the people of the world live as as though they don't know or believe in God. God sends a flood but saves Noah and his family. So unbelief brings destruction. Verse 5, we see the text say God was unable to do a miracle there. This passage doesn't mean that God was powerless to perform miracles but that he chooses to not perform any more miracles because of their unbelief. A similar account of the same story we see in Matthew 13, verse 58. And in verse 58, it says, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So the unbelief is a reason why there were no more miracles that Jesus performed while in Nazareth. Jesus is all powerful, all sovereign, and he chooses to not do more mighty works. He chooses to not perform more miracles because of their unbelief. So in summary, going through the text line by line taught us that Jesus was born from a small town where no, no one significant was thought to come from there. Jesus, after preaching, teaching, healing, and performing miracles, walks back into Nazareth, his hometown where he grew up. He teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath. There is an in- initial amazement because of the authority and wisdom of his teaching. As they continue to listen, they grow in contempt, in scorn for a man they knew or a man they thought they knew, who was one of them, but now teaches with authority and performs miracles. They don't understand, and they even ask, who does he think he is? Showing their lack of understanding of who Jesus is. The contempt and unbelief from the people of his hometown is the reason why Jesus does not perform miracles But Jesus does continue to teach and preach. So some reflections from the text. We understand a little bit more about the text, how the text is shaped. Let's look at familiarity as the first point. There are two kinds of familiarity. There's a familiarity that blinds, that can cause a lack of understanding and appreciation. The people in Nazareth, in the synagogue, remember Jesus as a young boy. They know his mom. They know his brothers and sisters. This familiarity brought about contempt. They knew Jesus, and because he performed miracles, he healed, but he was like one of them. Therefore, they could not see Jesus for who he is, the Son of God who had been healing, who had been preaching, who had been teaching and performing miracles. They heard about these miracles as he was moving from town to town, and they saw his teaching, but could not still get over the familiarity. What are some of the things that can build contempt in us? That can build a dangerous familiarity. Maybe for people who grew up in a church or home background can grow cold to who Jesus is because they heard Jesus regularly. And they've become familiar with the stories about Jesus but miss the magnitude, the sovereignty and the power of Jesus through these stories. The stories that they're so familiar with. We should not be a people that have grown cold or so familiar to Jesus that we forget or we don't recognize him as Lord, or a people that forget the magnitude of the victory we have in the cross. Sometimes we speak about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. If we become too familiar with this, then we forget the magnitude of the cross. Without the cross, we face the wrath of God because we can do nothing in and of ourselves to save our relationship between us and God. We can do nothing to fix our relationship with God. Sin has victory over us without Jesus. We are bound and slaves to sin without the cross. Listen to this quote from John Piper. Life is wasted if we do not grasp the glory of the cross. Cherish it for the treasure that it is and cleave to it as the highest, pe- as the highest price of every pleasure and the deepest comfort in every pain. What was once foolishness to us, a crucified God, must become our wisdom and our power, and our only boast in this world. The death of Jesus 
who is God, like we read in chapter 1, verse 1, the spoiler alert, should be enough to bring us to a place of amazement of the love that God has for us. Jesus is beaten. He's spat on. A crown of thorns is put on his head. He's whipped, pulls and carries a cross to which he will be nailed. The cross is heavy. It is made up of thick wood. Jesus is nailed onto that same cross using steel square nails. A square nail has an edge that would, that would make it much harder to go through the skin and also much more painful. The length was about 9 inches, which is about 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters is around the same length as a size 7 or 8 shoe. This square and long nail pierces through his hands and feet. The nail has to be hit multiple times through Jesus' hands and feet till it sinks into the wood deep enough to hold him up. His feet are placed on on one on top of the other and nailed through onto the wood. As the cross is lifted, Jesus is in pain. He continues to slide down and has to pull himself up again just to relieve the pressure from his back. This places pressure on his hands as well as he keeps moving up and down to relieve pressure from his back or his feet. He's pierced on the side and blood gushes out. This is what Jesus had to endure for you and for me. He is the Son of God, Mark 1, verse 1, and therefore can quench the wrath of God and die for our sins on the cross. This is the second kind of familiarity we should have. We should know the truth of who Jesus is. We should have a relationship with Jesus. The relationship and intimacy with God is what enables our faith. It becomes our wisdom and power like the quote we just read. Our faith should be placed in Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. We should be amazed at the king who preaches and teaches with authority. We should approach God as sovereign king, as son of God. Our faith should be in Jesus, the risen king. Sometimes familiarity that blinds and and, and builds contempt also comes from the confusion or disappointment or frustration from unmet expectations and maybe from clarity that the gospel brings. So sometimes we believe and think we know and understand the attributes we should have as Christians, like peace, like kindness, like mercy, like love, but we are faced with challenges, challenging situations in marriage, in the workspace, in relationships. Or when we face the mirror of the word of God that is lifted by the Holy Spirit, we face disappointment, frustration, and confusion which builds contempt. Tim Keller says, sanctification is not by works, but by a continuous reorienting ourselves to our justification. So sanctification is not moralistic, yet it takes enormous effort. So it is not quietistic. When we feed on, remember, and live in accordance with our justification, it mortifies our idols and fills us with an inner joy and desire to please and resemble our Lord through obedience. Sometimes the process of sanctification, reorienting ourselves to be justified by the cross, which gives us life, brings about disappointment, frustration, and confusion. However, we should remember that sanctification is not moralistic. It's not meant to be a stick that we feel breaks us, because then we might be living out of our own belief and strength. We need to be filled and feed on the word of God. We need to remember the work of God on the cross. We need to live as those who believe the cross brings life. This quietens, this mortifies, mortifies meaning to subdue or suppress the idols that push us away from God. So feeding on the word of God, being filled by it, remembering the magnitude of the cross should fill us with this inner joy. So let us be a people with a familiarity that breeds awe, that develops intimacy, that breeds amazement from the love of God that is found in the cross. Unbelief. So Jesus chooses to not perform any more miracles because of their unbelief. Sometimes our doubt and unbelief stands in the way of our access to God or stands in the way of us receiving the miracles and blessings of God. So in unbelief, we may not experience or encounter God. We need to have faith in God in order to live for him, in order to be obedient, in order to see and experience him. 
The faith needs to be in Jesus and his death on the cross for us, his finished work. Just to be clear, our faith does not disable or change God's sovereign and perfect plan and will. However, God does give the gift of faith. And through that faith, is able to fulfill his ultimate plan and will through people. Like the faith of the centurion Roman soldier healed his servant. We see Jesus heal, and at times through the gospel, we see that the faith of the individual healed them. In Mark 6, verse 6, we see God seeing the lack of faith and not performing miracles. God is all-powerful. He is sovereign, meaning supreme ruler and all-powerful. He knows all things, and he institutes his perfect plan to defeat sin and create the perfect relationship that he had with us when he created the world. So faith is an important part of our work with God, but it does not disable or or, or, or disempower God. Faith is an important part of our work with God. Hebrews 11 verse 6, Now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This doesn't mean that faith itself is a special power, but it's that our faith and the subject of our faith is God. He desires for us to be in relationship with him, which also means to trust him, which also means to know him, which also means intimacy with him. If you continue reading Hebrews 11, you will see more examples of faith. Verse 28, by faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rehab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who thought faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power, of fire, the, the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. So God doesn't need our faith to perform miracles. And our faith doesn't change God's plan. However, God uses the faith to bless, to protect, to heal. He does use faithful men and women to continue his work, to make himself known. Unbelief also hampers the church. As a church, we must believe that God is worthy to receive our praise, that God desires to do something in and through us, through us in the city of Centurion, to reach and touch the lives of people in our community. If we believe, we can then live this in truth and see God use that to do what he desires to do in the city. As we close, do you have faith? What areas of your life do you need help with unbelief? Do you have faith in God for your family? Do you have faith in God for your work? Do you have faith in God for his provision? Is this faith visible in how you give? Is it visible in how you spend your time? How you use your gifts? Do you have faith in God? Do you see Jesus as the Son of God? Do you see the authority and wisdom he has as we read his word? Do you see, just, do you just, do you see Jesus walk on the pages of scripture as you read the Bible? Do you read the Bible? If you don't read it, how do you think you will build up your faith? How do you think you will know him? Sometimes we speak about reading the Bible, but there are a few helpful tips. So reading the Bible is, is what we should do. It's part of being a disciple of Jesus. But your world and your worldview will not easily be changed if you do not engage the Word of God. We can engage the Word of God by preaching, teaching, reading, and meditating on the Word of God. So preaching simply means speaking to audiences that are not part of your smaller circle. So teaching simply means speaking to audiences that are part of your smaller circle where you can share more, clarify more, and speak more about what God is teaching you and in turn teaching others. 
So let's think about this. Your favorite lipstick or cosmetic brand, L'Oreal or MAC. Yes, I do know the brands. Uh, you don't just use it, do you? Um, you tell others that are part of your close circle about it. You tell them about the benefits. You tell them about the price point, the applications of it. You also tell people in your close circle you might, that, you might, that you might even borrow them some of, some of the cosmetics. You meditate on it. You think about it. You think about how you can make it last longer. You think about what other things you need in the ecosystem of the cosmetics. So you're engrossed by it. It's a part of who you are. And you know it. That should be our approach to the Bible. So maybe you're a runner. What do you do? You preach about running. Um, sometimes you see someone with a label or brand while at the shop or maybe a, a t-shirt of the last comrades, then you're immediately able to strike up a conversation. You tell people in your smaller circle about running, you invite them to Strava. Uh, I think that's the running app. <laughs> you, you tell them where and which shoes they should, they should buy. Um, you teach others around you about how to run better. You tell them about your latest running regime. You meditate on it. I don't know, but maybe you even dream across, run, you dream running across the finish line of the comrades, maybe. Probably think about how you executed that last five or 10 kilometers. Don't worry, runners, I know there's 21 and, and 42 kilometer races as well. So you just, you, you're engrossed by it. You think about it. You think about running. It becomes a part of who you are. Maybe you are not a runner or don't know Mac and L'Oreal, but maybe you have a favorite sports club or sports code. You find people who are wearing the same sporting clothes and immediately you start talking to them. That's the preaching, that's speaking to people within a wider space. So you preach to people that, that, that you don't know very well. You find ways to tell them about what you know. Then you use WhatsApp status to post about the success or failures of the club or the sport. Then you're teaching or you're going towards a smaller circle. You're teaching about how to become better. I met Nicole Taliad from the Spa Proteas, not to be confused with the normal Proteas, who, who bounces a ball against the post to get closer to scoring a netball goal. So sorry for the diehard fans for, for calling it a goal. Um, that, that's what I know for now. So I met her on WhatsApp statuses as people were teaching and speaking about their favorite sports code. So you teach those near to you. You bring them into the culture. You teach the gens around the fire about the latest tactics that your coach employs. You meditate on the sport, constantly thinking about how you can constantly thinking about how you can make it better. About the next great thing, you read about it from the social platforms, from the magazines. You are engrossed with it. It becomes who you are. We should not only read the Bible, but we should be engrossed with it. We should tell others about it. We should teach people about it. Tell the people that are closest to us what you're reading and how it affects and touches you. That is how it, help, that's how it helps you to meditate on it. That's what makes it more real. Then you're able to see Jesus walking off the pages of scripture and see that he is worthy of all our affection. He is worthy of all our praise and adoration. He is worthy of our trust. This would be someone who knows in the midst of their situation, whether God, good or bad, that he deserves the glory. God deserves the glory, whatever situation that you're in. Do you surrender all to God? Do you bow the knee? Do you desire to know him more? That is how we build familiarity that breeds intimacy and creates opportunities for us to know and encounter God through being engrossed by his word and seeing that he is worthy and seeing that he's king and kings and lord of lords, that he is the son of God and we can put our faith and trust in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that through your word we see and we learn that you are the Son of God. We pray that you 
would help our unbelief. At points in our life, we believe that you're the son of God, but there may be places of unbelief where we do not believe you in certain areas of our life. So we believe in you, but the places of unbelief help our unbelief. Help us to bring our unbelief before you and for you to transform that unbelief. Help us to engage your word. Help us to engage the Bible, for that is how you speak to us. That is how you use the Holy Spirit to bring comfort, to bring peace, and to rebuke where rebuke is needed. May we be a people that grow in familiarity with you, but are in awe and astonished by the love that you have for us. That we are in awe and astonished by all that you continue to do as we read your word, as you, as you perform miracles, and you continue to do that now. And we see the greatest miracle in making more and more people part of your family, part of your kingdom through the death of Christ on the cross. So help us to be engrossed by your word, to be changed by your word, to be transformed by your word. Help us by your spirit to draw near to you when times are good or when times are bad. Help our unbelief. Draw us near to yourself. Change and transform our hearts. Make them more like yours. In Jesus' name, amen.